All right, people, welcome to the Besides the Norm podcast. We have uh, Ross Gillander. Gillander's up. That's probably the name, perfect. <laughs> uh, Ross Gillander from the Anstruder Science Cafe. Now, uh, we, sort of, we've been going through the sort of What's On and Fife uh, website trying to find out a bunch of places that we're interested in speaking to a bunch of people. Uh, Anstruder Science Cafe sounded dead interesting, especially to you, because you were like, I would go to that sort of thing. Because right. you're, well, you're a wee bit smarter than me, to be fair. <laughs> Uh, aye. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, so this is basically why we got you in because uh, we are obviously atheists and we kind of follow science as best we can uh-huh. all the time. So it'd be great to kind of talk about your history and stuff like that and how you kind of manage to start sure. doing what you do, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So if we can maybe start by sort of talking about your kind of original interest in science and why you got into it. Okay, well I suppose um, I was interested in science at school in high school way back in. Uh, Long time ago, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the uh, I suppose I was yeah, I was doing physics and chemistry and things like that, and I decided to do physics at university. And the original kind of interest in, in that was my father, who works in the, the oil industry. Mm-hmm. He said, "Oh, you know these instrumentation guys up in up there in, in Aberdeen, they, they make an enormous amount of money." Right. I was like, "That sounds good then." And so I'd gone to to Cali and did my undergraduate in uh, instrumentation with applied physics. Mm-hmm. Um, which I really loved. I, I loved the the course and all the the, the, the things we'd done with it, and it, it'd gone from everything from you know kind of pure mathematics and, uh, and things like that up to more uh, applied engineering and things like that. And, mm. and my final um, my final year project, I had built this um, small oxygen sensor, a little optical oxygen sensor, um, and it worked and everything was great. But the chemistry department had given us these little films that were fluorescent and they had really fascinated me how, how did that part work I had done the electronics and the, the optics of it but this little chemical film had uh, intrigued me and I saw it Strathclyde which at the time was uh, this was in conjunction with Bell College which is now part of University of West of Scotland mm-hmm. which used to be Paisley you know um, so they, they had this kind of joint PhD uh, on offer so I, I went for that and uh, we were developing a lot of thin film oxygen sensors with polymers and materials called sol gels and, and things like that and I just really loved it and mm-hmm. it was quite a successful project because at the end of the three years PhD I had five publications from it and, and very good journals and things so yeah. I thought right this is really what I want to do now you know so we'd um, I was kind of generally kept in op- optical sensors mostly for oxygen and mm-hmm. things like contaminated water or wastewater lines and things like that Um so that for a while, and, and uh, for food packaging and things like that, and eventually I was working in industry for a while in Cork, in Ireland, again developing kind of water-based instrumentations for companies. So people yeah. would, people would come to us and say that I want to have a, a fish tank water uh, quality sensor, so we'd build it for them and, and things mm-hmm. like that. Uh, and eventually I wanted to come back to Scotland. So about two and a half, almost three years ago, I saw the uh, an advert from St Andrews, who were looking for an optical sensor person to look at. Uh, um, sensors for detecting landmines uh, yeah. as part of this massive project that, that was happening at the time, an EU project called um, Tiramisu uh, so I went into that and in St Andrews in the physics department there's been a lot of uh, work done on these materials called conjugated polymers yeah. which are basically um, so the polymers are like plastics but they conduct electricity under certain circumstances and part of that is they absorb light and they emit light at a different uh, wavelength, you know, mm. so that, for example if you were to shine blue light onto them they will give you green light and this green light would be um, sensitive in the case of these polymers to nitroaromatic molecules which are things like TNT and, and DNT and certain pesticides, mm-hmm. so if you expose these films to things like TNT, this light level drops down so it's a bit like a dimmer switch right, you know. Right. So, so if, you, if you expose it to these kind of things then it, like a dimmer switch, this, this green light for example comes down so, so my job in that project was to develop this instrument where you can take this very kind of uh, advanced material, uh, which works very well in the lab in very con- controlled conditions, yeah. and take it out into the field in a place like Croatia, where you've got wind and rain and people walking about and trucks moving around and, and all these things, you know. So, so that's what I was doing over the past few years here in, um, uh, in St Andrews. And right. uh, we're still working on it now because we've, we've got the prototype working, but it's still not good enough to take it out into this kind of field environment. So that's what I'm working on at the moment with it. Well, that's because my basic understanding, uh, when you sort of said you were wanting to talk about this, was that um, 
I'd, I'd assumed you'd sort of recently started doing it. I didn't realise you were at this such kind of late stage. Mm-hmm. So you're at a point now where you could actually, uh, is it a working proto- prototype? It's a working prototype, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of, it's not it's, it's not close yet to kind of being out in the field with actual D-miners, you know, but yeah. we, we talk to them quite a lot and we have a lot of input with them and say, do you like it? Do, you know, uh, what do you want to do? What do you not want to do? And, and yeah. in, in terms of things like... Uh, you know, the weight of it, you know, you don't want something that's too heavy and you don't want something that's too right. light either because yeah. mm-hmm. people think it's cheap if it's really light, you know, so uh, right, uh, right. I've got this two kilo uh, box now, you know, and it's it, it's, it's quite nice, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm really just trying to get it further and further and further along t- and so it can be used eventually alongside things like uh, metal detectors and mm-hmm. ground penetrating radars and things, because I mean, the, the problem, one of the many problems of landmines is the, the fact that there's no... Um, single solution for them, you know, like a metal yeah. detector would miss a plastic mine, for example, or um, radar doesn't work so well if it's a uh, humid environment or, or water clogged, right. you know. So, so the idea would be with, with this massive project we, we were working on, so there's 25 partners from around Europe, and uh, we're all working on kind of different aspects of it basically. And that, the idea would be that uh, uh, a demining um, kind of manager, so to speak, would go along yeah. to a site. Uh, whether that would be in somewhere like Croatia, which is European kind of climate, mm-hmm. or somewhere like Colombia, which is extremely you know leafy and, and mountainous, or Africa, which is very dry and sandy, or Southeast Asia, which obviously the monsoon seasons and stuff. Mm-hmm. But they can go along, uh, survey the environment, and say it will take that, that, and that. So they have this toolbox for for demining. So mm-hmm. that's that's what ours is for. So it kind of works in the same uh, the same way as a, a sniffer dog, basically, where right. you know <coughs> these very specific chemicals then come up from the ground after a long, long time, and we can detect tiny, tiny amounts of them. So uh, like this is, that was what I was going to ask: is what you actually detect? But it's, it's the chemicals mm-hmm. coming through the mines as opposed to the actual physical mines. That's true. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. So the the landmines are normally buried no more than 10 centimetres under the ground. Usually less than that because if you consider how landmines are laid, it's somebody who's running away basically and flinging them down. Right? Maybe cover them a, a wee yeah. bit with, with, with dirt or whatever. So they're not usually that deep but they sit there for a long time and this vapour eventually comes up. Right. You know, and it's, it's, it's right. be there for decades. Like a battery sort of thing if you leave it for long enough it starts taking a seep. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So that's it, yeah. So mm-hmm. the um, so, so that's the kind of the idea. So when dogs go around and sniff, we kind of we don't replace the dogs because you know the dogs are good, but uh, but they're very. Dogs can be quite um, you know what dogs are like you know I mean, mm-hmm. sniffer dogs think that they're playing a game. It's the same in airports and everywhere else you know. And sometimes dogs don't want to play the game you know and they yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll dig themselves in and go right that's it I'm no I'm, I'm not playing anymore you know. <laughs> so that's what we can kind of come in and, and, and do it then you know. So this is like a, a kind of a mobile thing that you're able to make like that kind of how close can it go? It, just now, it's, it's a few centimetres above the ground. Right. But I'm adapting it at the moment because it... So it can go right up to the mine rather than kind of... Does it have to be like a good few metres away or something? No, no, really close to it. Right. You know, so so yeah, a few, we kind of need it to be close so that the vapours can... Because yeah, it's yeah. so dilute, effectively, it needs to be sucked up into the... Yeah. Uh, past the sensor. Ah, uh, see, yeah. I thought it was going to be further away. Yeah, that's. I, I thought you were like... Because you were talking about lasers, that you'd be... Taking it from like a certain area away, so you'd be able to look no, at no, it. That's no, 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 it's very close. Yes, I mean, the idea would be that we can put it onto a robot as well or a, or some <laughs> kind of vehicle, you know, ah, yeah, right, right, right. Like that, yeah. right. but something could, it could be handheld. I mean, a lot of the D miners, like, they do get really close to these things, you know, and they, they yeah. dig at them really, really carefully, you know. Yeah, see, I, I, I was assuming that it would be something to replace somebody needing to walk about with a, a metal detector just in case there was a sort of a mess up in some way. Okay, you yeah. accidentally activate a mine in some way. Yeah, I mean, there has to be a, kind of a quality assurance in that sense, you know, and as I say, you wouldn't, you'd never use just one instrument to, to try and clear a place, you know, so mm-hmm. you do you do go in with metal detector and a dog and and something else, you right. know. Yeah, so. Just so you've got kind of multiple backup sort of thing, just to kind of keep yourselves yeah, safe, yeah. sort of thing, really. Yeah, yeah, that's it, you know, and then, then eventually oh. you, you can you can get rid of them, you know. So, are you, uh, how how far are you right now? Are you at a point where you're actually able to um, do the job, sort of thing? <laughs> well, no, not, not at the moment. It's it's not um, it's not advanced enough that I would want to put somebody's life <laughs> right, right. in, in the, the hands of this thing, you know, but. We do controlled field trials, you know, so mm. uh, this September I'm going back out to Croatia to, to test it. And we work with um, some colleagues in Zagreb and Zadar universities and they work with bees, they're bee experts. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, the bee, and the bees are good for this as well. You can train bees to, to find landmines as well. Yeah, I know. I've heard yeah, you see that? <laughs> use bees in some airports to find yeah, certain things yeah, as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And apparently, it's much quicker to train them. It's like a few hours. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. They're pretty easy to train. You, you get like a little dish of TNT, for example, right? Yeah. And you put a, a glass of sugar water on top of it. And the bees fly across the TNT and they smell that, right? And then they get the sugar water, so they associate then the smell with getting it. The same as a dog, really. They associate the oh. smell with getting a treat, right? I remember <laughs> first telling you and Ma about that and you were like, Patch! Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> fucking <laughs> snuffer bees! It's been a few seconds on Google for me to just completely just go, oh, well, we're not sure. Aye, totally. <laughs> totally. I couldn't believe either. I was like, fucking what? I think, again, my stupid mind came into play and I was imagining wee bees on leads. Well, that, on leads. <laughs> that automatically, <laughs> so, the first thing I thought was a guy walking about with a bee on a lead. <laughs> I don't know why that's the first thing that comes to your head, but it's because, because we're psychic. <laughs> that's just, no, just the way we are. But, um, so, again, you're at a point now where you're able to kind of test all this stuff. Um, how far do you, how far along do you think it will be for, from where you're able to actually put it into the... Probably the a, few, a few years yet, you know. Cause you, you got, like, loads of things you need to go through? And do you know exactly the things you need to do to this uh, machine? Or? Pretty much, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm updating it at the moment, or upgrading it, so that um, we, we've started this new, kind of new project where... So, okay, the problem is that you've got this very dilute amount of vapour coming out yep. that the ground rates. It's a very, very small amount. And in the lab, that's okay, because we control that environment. But, again, mm-hmm. the slightest breeze is going to blow it away and, and, and that kind of thing. So we've found this material where uh, it's kind of a standard polymer, basically a rubbery polymer. Mm-hmm. And if you um, expose that to explosives the explosives stick to it very, very easily. And you heat it, and that, that releases this uh, this vapour from the surface. Yeah. So it kind of concentrates it all onto this bit of rubber, effectively. Right. So I've, I've upgraded my instrument now to have a little kind of heater inside it, and we're, we're at the moment trying to characterise these materials so we can take them out and just really load them up with the um, with the explosives from the ground. So even mm-hmm. you've got a, a fairly powerful vacuum. It's like hoovering the ground, basically, mm-hmm. with this, this kind of rubber material inside it. And it all gets exposed, and then you, you put it into your instrument, and then it's kind of the theory is it will be a lot more sensitive that way, you know. Yeah. So yeah, so that, that'll be September. We will go out and do that, and, and our pals the bees as well. Mm-hmm. And, um, That's going to be cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, are you, you thought about uh, filming this, these kind of expeditions? Like yeah, that, yeah, you know? yeah. I'm actually. I mean, the I think the that this field in general is it's really interesting, you know, and, mm-hmm. and the people you meet in this in this field. A lot of them, as well, aren't scientists at all. A lot of them are these kind of D-miners who are... Um, a lot of them have military backgrounds or, or, or whatever else. A lot of them are just... That's their job, is a D-miner, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, and other people, obviously, there are engineers and scientists, but a lot of them policy makers and educators and things like that. Um, I'd, I'd love to be able to film it and put out a, a short kind of... Uh, a short documentary. Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would um, be quite cool, actually. I would oh, watch definitely, that. Definitely. Mm. I, like, I like sort of wee technical things like that. That's quite mm. cool. Yeah. Is it just St Andrews University working on this, or is it in Scotland? I uh, there's there are a few people around the world that are doing using the similar materials uh, mm-hmm. for for explosives. I mean, there's a, a big uh, group in America who basically, I mean, they they really invented this uh, in a sense in right. MIT. So they do this, and then there's um, there's some people around places like uh, in Turkey and China and things like that. But even in Europe, it's not very you know. I presume you're in contact with these other people. Relatively regularly, some of them, yeah, we we are in contact with some of them, you know. But uh, but everyone kind of plays their own furrow in that sense, you know. Right. Uh, um, in the way that the, the we we're part of this specific project, you know, so, so we're applying our stuff there. And, but, I mean, the the, the 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 MIT people know know our group quite well and things like that, you know. Yeah. So mm-hmm. um, it's excellent. That's what I love about science. Everybody's actually willing to work together mm. and get into a kind of. A, 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 a great idea sort of thing uh, yeah, yeah. Rather, than no, kind like, of, rather than people kind of taking their ideas I know there's some people like that that like to have their ideas to themselves yeah. and kind of not share it that's what patent patent well, yeah, yeah. I'll have to say that word patenting <laughs> Pat- patenting uh, <laughs> is uh, kind of one of the biggest problems I see for science a lot of the time patent well patenting see this is a problem <laughs> it's a different yeah. word sorry see th- this is an issue I've got w- with the anti-GMO crowd is that they've got a a real problem with patenting, mm-hmm. right? And the, the reason that patenting exists, it's a shit word, is yeah. because <laughs> these these institutions are putting a lot of money in the technology to make these certain things, mm-hmm. and in order to get the money back, they need to be guaranteed 
a sort of a place in the sale market mm-hmm. and if they didn't have patents they didn't get that so they need to make their money back eventually it's a, not a, it's not an unflawed system but it's, it's uh, yeah, sort of pretty sure. much the only system that exists for that sort of thing so fuck you no I'm sorry no, no, just, <laughs> I told her I, I didn't like patents but they're kind of yeah. needed well, that's, that's, it, that's it absolutely absolutely but it's great that they're all working together on kind of getting one of the biggest problems I've seen for years is these kind of big, huge fucking areas in certain countries aye. when the mines are sitting there and people are dying all the fucking time. Oh, aye, aye. They have to cross these things sometimes mm. and it's just an absolute pain in the arse. All this shit is political as well, though, because mm. universities need funding and yeah. science needs funding and a lot of politicians don't want to fund science as much as they need to. And that's a fucking really big issue and they didn't seem to want to talk about this they want to just talk about shit as opposed to talking about real important issues do you have an issue with this like um, a lot of can, uh, your government America specifically they do it 10 times more than we do but um, profit and putting more profit towards can, uh, the military and stuff like that rather than putting it towards science a lot of things I, 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 I think so oh, definitely I mean for example, I mean, an issue that's close to home for me would be the Trident uh, system, yeah. right? The, the nuclear weapons, which is uh, an obscene amount. I mean, it's an obscene thing in itself, but mm-hmm. it's an obscene amount of money that's uh, that gets spent on this, right? Yeah. And um, and yeah, I mean, the universities needs as much funding as possible. I mean, it's not not just in terms of the the, the science itself, but in keeping the staff, retaining staff, and mm-hmm. you know, and staff morale and all of these things. I mean, uh, the majority of people, or the majority of research fellows, so to speak, are um, are on contracts, you know. <laughs> Like uh, yearly contracts or whatever, and there's this kind of that kind of thing. Um, whereas, if the money that was spent on Trident was pumped into universities, you know, like it would, it would make a huge difference. Exactly. But uh, it's it's not happening. So, I don't I don't see I don't see the UK government doing that much for for science at all. You know, I mean, obviously you have these kind of um, uh, funding bodies like EPSRC who do physics and, I was just and chemistry and stuff, and stuff like that, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you get the BBSRC that deal with biology and medicine or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I mean, it is always competitive funding. I mean, if you write a proposal for something, it's not necessarily going to be funded. Yeah. Uh, and that doesn't mean it's a bad idea or anything. It just might be if there's a hundred people going for, <clears throat> you know, a, a very restricted amount of money, then it can only go to maybe. 10 of them out of 100 or something you know so and it's the same for European funding that's very um, competitive as well um, but yeah I mean so that this, this is a, the the way it works at the moment but, um, yeah who knows so, what the future will bring well, there you go, there you go. So, <laughs> what about the other work do you do is this your kind of your main, main focus or do you do other stuff for the university this is my main focus so I mean I do a little bit of kind of lab um, teaching during the, the semesters. So for, you do kind of a wee bit of lecture and stuff. Like that. I, I, it's yeah. most of the labs that I do. So right. I, I do um, optics for second years, you know, and then um, a, we, we do a, a module called uh, Towards the Quantum Limits mm-hmm. for uh, uh, third years, right. and that's, that's to do with kind of I don't know if you know the single photon experiment where. Oh, I'm well aware of the <laughs> single photon experiment. I'm just, yeah. just... Well, this is why we've got this one because you could explain <laughs> these things. Okay? Yeah, I mean that that one is it's kind of the the, the famous um, quantum physics experiment, you know, where you show that light acts as a, a wave and a particle at the same time, mm-hmm. and it kind of a, a single photon can interfere with itself. Totally. Yeah, yeah you know, so we, we do things like that, and um, looking at a thing called a pole trap, where you can you, you know you, you can trap these kind of uh, spores in, in mid air, you know, and they kind of mm-hmm. they hover there and things. So it's uh, I, I like doing it, you know, it's it's nice to be able to to deal with students. Um, and can I pass? I, I think you know, especially when you when you get experienced and uh, and even in industry and things like that, yeah, you, you have a kind of a, a duty to yeah, kind of bring on the new wave sort of thing. Like yeah, that, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. I think this, so. is a, this is a question that I've always been interested in. Scientists are quite happy to admit that they've fucked up at some stage. I definitely if, am. If, yeah. they're, if they're wrong, they'll say shit. I was wrong there. Uh-huh. <laughs> My bad. Have you had many experiences in lecturing and being? turning out to be wrong where you were lecturing or is it sort of so set in its ways that you're kind of there's no much <sighs> error there not that I can think of I've maybe misspoken or something but I can't think of ever stating something as a fact and then having to see the way I thought about that was like um, I come into I was watching I was watching someone talking about this before that because science can moves on really quite slowly a lot of the time mm. because there's loads of stuff being discovered 
So it's kind of hard to move on to the next thing yeah. a lot of the time. So it's really hard to kind of say that something's uh, sort of set in its way and then maybe mm. it might only be 20 years later that you find out that directly that that's... Yeah, not, yeah. I mean, so. I think that's definitely the case with... Um, I mean, in applied physics more, it, it's maybe a bit faster because you do have that kind of engineering aspect of it where you're constantly building things and then something new comes out, a new mm. microprocessor or something like that, which makes your thing more faster or, or yeah. whatever. Um Maybe in theoretical stuff, it's maybe a bit slower. But I mean, for us, like, um, I mean, one thing I think that would actually really help science is, and some people do talk about this, but I don't see it gaining much traction. Is so okay? We, we have to publish papers, right? So you do a, a block of work, for example, and you say, right, we, we have these results that prove that this is sensitive to TNT, for mm. example. Uh, so you publish that, but a lot of the time, the uh, a project will have. Every project on Earth, you know, will, will have gone through kind of failures of things that didn't work, yeah. you know, or formulations that didn't work or whatever. And some people say, well, what we should do is still publish the things that didn't work because then, then it, it avoids any kind of duplication of that. Yeah. Where somebody, if, if I was to see that a certain polymer wasn't um, wasn't robust enough or, or something like that to use in water, for example, I said, mm-hmm. right, bin that, you know, I won't use that again. And then I would write up the results that worked, a good polymer that was good in water. But somebody else might go away and, and spend a year trying to get this thing oh, to work, yeah. and you know. So I, I think I personally think that'd be really useful to to, to publish your Definitely. bad results. You know, maybe I'm weird, but I actually enjoy reading the failures. Yeah, <laughs> it seems to get. I think it teaches you quite a bit as well. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. sometimes it could teach you nothing, but occasionally it could teach you. Uh, yeah, a lot, so just as much as the. Seems you asked the book for a year. We want. Oh, yeah, sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. I imagine that if you would spent two years working on something oh, and find like somebody's done it. Work, if you imagine like uh, Ross was in the middle of working on a paper and he's already just done, he's done something like the week before and he's written about it, and then you're also trying something and then he puts it the paper that someone he done a year ago doesn't work uh-huh. uh, and you've just wasted an entire fucking year. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. An absolute pain in the ass. I love your pain in the car. No, like. But I, I don't think it's going to happen, to be honest. I, I, I think it's all just like a human nature of being kind of not wanting to admit your mistakes. Mm-hmm. Maybe, you know. Um, it's a very annoying thing about humans. <laughs> There's many annoying things about humans, right. aren't there? <laughs> yes, yes there are. <laughs> That's it. So uh, if we can move on and talk about uh, the main, oh, sorry, can we, can we talk about the, the most? Important, oh, sorry, sorry, I totally forgot. The most important oh. physics question. This isn't really your field, so okay. you might be struggling a wee bit with this. Right, okay. But could you explain the complex theory behind boomerangs? Uh, I don't think so. Um, Told you, possible. <laughs> well, it has. Uh, I mean, let's see. I mean, a boomerang has like a. It's, it's not just a, a cut out bit of wood, is it? It's got like a plane wing. I think, but it has this little kind of um, angle to it. Mm-hmm. I think, I like on the outside, the curves on the inside, they have like a wee bit of curve on the inside. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, that's, weird. so that's what gives it the lift, right? And what gives it the... I don't know why it comes back. <laughs> I, <laughs> no. I've tried so hard, I've read actual published papers mm-hmm. on this, People waste and their time. People <laughs> waste their time through fucking boomerangs. <laughs> and I oh, cannot understand why it comes back. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I mean, it's probably very simple when you watch it properly, but to explain it is. No, I have no idea. <laughs> well, we watched a guy throwing. What was it? An axe? Oh, yeah, the the well, guy well, made well, an axe into a boomerang. Oh, really? And he an threw it and it fucking came back shape. to him. What the fuck? <laughs> Witchcraft, total witchcraft. <laughs> it must be to do with the lift, and then it, maybe as, it's, as it reaches its furthest point, it starts to fall, and then the opposite wing catches it or something. Mm-hmm. Similar to that. Let's yeah. just go with that. That seems like. The I, I don't think I've ever thrown one successfully. I think I had a shot of one once, and it just kind of oh, just kind of fell, you know. Because there's an act as well. It's not just. You just oh, you need to throw it, it properly. Just, oh, yeah. Fuck. You have to throw it like a specific because that guy was talking about wind direction and stuff that affects the. Aye, aye. aye. Let's see. That, that Batman throw was incredible, though. Do we have to get a boomerang expert on? We need. And will we find <laughs> one in Scotland? Can't imagine there's too many boomerang experts. In Australia will be the perfect area to get that. You have to go on a, a field trip then to Australia to find the guy. You know? <laughs> so good. A documentary on boomerangs. <laughs> That would be the worst documentary in the world, I think. I oh, know, it's just an absolute waste of time. 
<laughs> what do you feel about these scientists that are kind of like wasting their times on things like these, like kind of boomerang exploration and? Uh, no, I don't. I don't see it's a waste. I, 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 I like um, the 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 pursuit of knowledge for the sake of it. I suppose mm-hmm. you know that that, that maybe would because a lot of people would um, criticise funding for art research or uh, yeah. English literature research or something like that, and I'm all for it. You know, I just think that you know, and boomerangs as well. It's eventually somebody will figure it out. You know, and uh, and then we'll know. You know, so um, they can be used for something else, maybe. Then we can get them on the podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly, <laughs> definitely. So the Answer Science Cafe was uh-huh. this a thing that you set up? You the, like the founder of this? I'm a co-founder of it. Yeah. So so there was um, originally so there was four of us at the start, and um, there was a guy who lives in Anstruther who used to be he's retired and he used to work in uh, the computing department at St Andrews, <laughs> and he was looking to set up a kind of a science festival in Anstruther. Um, and he put up an advert just saying, oh, if anyone's interested in setting up this kind of sci- a wee science fest for Anstro, I'll get in touch. So me and my wife um, got in touch and we were interested in the, the guy, Simon, who does the, he's the manager of the Fisheries Museum in Anstro. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of the four of us originally that, that set it up, you know. And um, the, the big problem has always been the, the, the venues, in a sense, you know, because we have um, we have a projector, so if people want to bring uh, slides and, and things like mm-hmm. that, uh, so originally we started off in a bar uh, called Barco in Cellardyke, which is actually yeah. a perfect. Set. I've actually been dro- driven past that bar, so. Okay, okay. yeah, I mean the thing. Just information, but. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> oh, it was it was a great place for that because, excuse me, <clears throat> it was uh, it was basically the, the walls were all white and it was a square um, bar, so mm. you, everyone could sit where they wanted. And it had couches and stuff like that, so it was quite comfy. But that closed down, and then we went to the Drill Tavern, which is sadly shut down as well, which is right. like a cracking pub, you know. And we used their conservatory, but they shut down on it was New Year basically they closed. So we're now in the Royal Hotel in Anstrola, which had reopened, yeah, yeah. Um, and we're in their dining room basically, you know. So I mean, as we've seen earlier, the because it's tourist season at the moment as well, it's kind of they're getting a big coach loads of yeah, you yeah. know tourists and stuff, so. Um, so that was it. But so yeah, we started off in the the science cafe. Um, so yeah, the, the festival idea didn't really gain traction. It was just a bit too ambitious, I think, for um, what we wanted to do. So the idea, so it was Norman's idea actually uh, to do the, this kind of science cafe. And a thing does exist called Cafe Scientifique, which mm-hmm. it's like a loose kind of. You get them all over the world, and they're all kind of loosely connected, I suppose. You know, mm-hmm. but we kind of um, we didn't want to. Go down that road for whatever reason, you know. We wanted to kind of plow our own furrow, and and uh, we didn't like the cafe scientific part either. It just <laughs> didn't seem right. Um, so yeah, so we did it, and, and we've had a pretty steady uh, um, roster of people coming in. You know, so we've had a lot of the people have been from the physics department because uh, because I know them, and, and you know it's yeah, easy yeah. enough to ask them. So we've had a lot of uh, astronomers in talking about all sorts of things from black holes to. Uh, the type of weather you get in different planets, you know, uh, which is all really interesting. We've had um, a colleague of mine who does, um, he basically uses optics to, to study these tiny little um, like prawns you get in the Antarctica, you know, and, mm-hmm. and to follow them around. And apparently, there's some fact about them that they're the for the size of them, they do the biggest, um, what do you call it, spawning kind of. Right. Uh, Region thing, you know, so so follows those. So a lot of uh, a lot of physicists and kind of optics people and we've had in um kind of science philosophers as well, talking about the philosophy of time travel, for example, which is quite good. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a guy who's he's, he does this quite a lot, um a guy called Lewis from the um psychology. I think I'm sure it's a psych- school of psychology. Uh but they're looking at so his, his thing is kind of can chimpanzee could a, could a chimpanzee be guilty of murder? Right. Mm-hmm. Because uh I don't want to spoil it or anything, you know, but okay, the, the point is, I mean, chimpanzees, they, they seem to be the only other creature apart from humans that will kill out a badness, just out of sheer badness, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, whereas mo- majority of animals will kill for food or for territory, or but mm. chimps will just do it, like, you know? I've um, just emailed a guy that's studying, uh, that does that kind of work. I reckon if that was the same guy, that would be weird. It so, he studies, like, how decisions are made, it could and well why be. people do bad decisions while knowing that they're bad and stuff like that. Oh, well, I don't know. I know I know he does other things, but um, it, it sounds fairly related. Is he is that St Andrews? I reckon. Yeah. I should, maybe I should have checked that. <laughs> well, it, may, it may be him. If he's at St Andrews, it may be. Yeah. Ah. So the original, well, what I thought it was, um, 
I sort of had in my mind that it would be a sort of networking session, as as much as it probably is. It, it can but be. I assume yeah. people just sit and having a cup of a cup of coffee, a wee panini, <laughs> <laughs> and talking science sort of thing. I just thought it would be like a meeting. But I, it seems like more like a. I can a talk base like can same maybe not a seminar but like I can talk. It's, it's a bit more inform- I mean, I so folks that have a pint and all that, and yeah. it's it's supposed to be informal. We do have a lot of, a lot of people that come aren't they scientists. You know, they are local people that are just interested in whatever the the topic might be, mm. um, and people are encouraged. You know, to kind of just ask questions during the thing. You know, so it's not like a lecture at, at yeah. university. You know, I like that. I, I and understand. it's quite good because you do end up getting quite a lot of interesting discussions. It usually lasts a couple of hours. You know, mm-hmm. um, so you, you know it's, it's it's really nice. You ever thought about filming some of these talks? You've done that before. You just no, we haven't actually. actually. <laughs> I'm so interested in filming some of these talks, like uh, a kind of TED talk kind of idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be like that. I think. How far know. away is? No, I'm sure there's not that far away. It's about 25 minutes or something. Oh, yeah. We could, we could go through and film someone. Maybe right. more than welcome. We'll not organise that here. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Hey. Aye, but anyway, aye, afterwards we'll... we'll ah, uh, definitely, man. That's aye. cool. See, I, I'm always into the, sort of the negative stuff with it. I'm a very negative person. <laughs> right. have, have you had any experience with sort of the anti-science crowd? No. I used to do a, a podcast on scepticism uh-huh. and sort of anti-scientific oh, right, beliefs, okay, so anti-GMO yeah. and anti-vaccines mm. and anti-climate Chains, yeah, yeah. Have you had much experience with those things? I had one guy um, who on Facebook, right, and I, I knew him in real life, you know, it was a guy in Cork, and um, he's into this thing called the alkaline diet, right? I don't know if you've heard of this. It sounds shite. Oh, already, it's, it's absolute shite, man. It's like, it's beyond shite, right? Well, what it is is, so people think that if you eat certain foods, right, so certain foods are acidic and certain foods are alkaline right? oh is this about the cancer it's the stop cancer aye it's, it's bon- <laughs> so, so what I mean so like a lot of pseudoscience it has a kind of a a basis in not a basis in truth I don't want to give the wrong impression ok if what I mean is they say alkaline foods are like fresh vegetables fresh fruit blah blah blah, blah. Yeah. acidic ones like burgers and beers and all this right? Well, so, lemons <laughs> well no no <laughs> lemons are lemons are officially uh, alkaline in their food group in right. their food group yeah lemons are alright I've been missing well, in their food group in their food I group no, 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 no in real life <laughs> right? Jesus Christ I've been taught so, wrong so the point of this is that they if they say that al- all alkaline foods are like broccoli and, and kale and carrots and all that mm. if that's all you eat of course you're going to lose weight and it's healthier and all this you don't right. drink you don't eat burgers and stuff right so it has that kind of grounding in Something that's real, mm-hmm. okay. But then they're saying, "Well, no." But if, so if you, I think the their, their theory comes from the fact that um, so cancers, so tumors exist in acidic environments, right? right? So therefore, if you're more alkaline, and this is radio, so people can't see that I'm doing the, the finger quotes, right? <laughs> I'm doing okay. Just assume that I'm doing finger quotes for the next five minutes constantly. <laughs> but uh, so so if if you're more alkaline, then you somehow prevent cancers, but what they don't know or don't realise is cancers, tumours... Or choose to not take on, take on board. Yes, yes. <laughs> they, they, uh, they create the acidic environment more. Mm-hmm. And um, another thing is you, you can't change the pH of your body. And the other thing is you have different pHs in your body, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, your blood is a very, very specific pH and it's kept that way through buffers. Mm-hmm. You know, this is, this is how we live right? Your saliva is different from your urine, and you've got stomach acid, right? Yeah. And all of these things. And, uh, and and these people think that you change your body's pH, and somehow it makes you healthier. And it's just, it's insane. It's just really insane. And uh, so I had this guy, and I, I, I got on quite well with him, you know, but he put out this pamphlet, and uh, he was selling it for five dollars. And um, A leaflet? Aye, but well, it was a pamphlet, so I think it was maybe 20 pages or something, right? And oh, he was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He was selling it, and I looked at the blurb, and it said, um, the alkaline diet's really healthy, and it's great, and I'm like, okay, fair enough, if you only tell folk to get exercise, and drink water, and eat broccoli, that's fine, right? Mm -hmm. But then he starts going on about how it it, it prevents cancer, and it can cure uh, mental health issues. And alarm bells ring for me then, right? Because I'm like, well, no, you you can't say that, you know, because... If you're going to get somebody who's really desperate, and this is how a lot of pseudoscientists grab mm-hmm. folk, isn't it? They're folk that are desperate, they're going to the GP or whatever, or the hospital, and their treatment just doesn't work, or doesn't seem to be working, so they get desperate and they go to all these wackos that promise them, like, fucking urine therapy and all this, mm-hmm. and they give them their money. You know, I, I can't imagine being that, um, you know, bereft of morals that I would take somebody's money mm-hmm. 
who are at the end of the tail. This is especially bad when it comes to mental health because if you're dealing with people oh. with anxiety and depression who already feel like their life's falling to bits, oh. and then they feel like their their medication is even if it is working, they, they've got it into their head that it's not working, and uh-huh. this is a chemical imbalance in the brain. Exactly. And exactly. These, Fuckles are feeding Aye. them absolute nonsense. Oh, it's infuriating. Mad. It's really infuriating, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I had a go at this guy and I said, look, you can't, you can't be saying that it's curing or it's preventing mental health and cancer and all this stuff, you know. And, uh, and then I was getting the kind of... And this, this is an issue, I think, as a scientist, if you're trying to do outreach and talk to the public, because you, I, I'm well aware that you can come across as being kind of superior. Absolutely. Trust yeah. me, I'm a scientist. You're no, trust me, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I try not to be like that, but it is, it is honestly quite difficult, I think, sometimes, especially in an argumentative situation. Mm-hmm. So if somebody's not a scientist, but anyway, this guy was going, oh, Ross, you're just cherry-picking the bad things you're wanting, you know, and you don't know how it works and all that. And I'm like, well, tell me how it works, man. I'm, I'm intrigued to know how you can change mm-hmm. your body's pH. And, uh, and I got a pile on for all his pals and all that. I would imagine uh, that there'd be a lot of sort of or oh, the date was to you is just an argument for authority. Aye, so aye, that exactly. Sort of this is exactly it. Yeah. And I was getting accused of like being uh, my, my my textbooks at university where I learned all this stuff was all funded secretly by the pharmacology <laughs> industry. Oh, I love right? the argument. Oh. It's so aye, but you can't yeah. win. You can't win. You, no, you're you, not going to win. Just going on, and I, I very rarely argue on the internet because it just it, it just doesn't end, right? <laughs> yeah. And um, I just look. I don't have the time for it. And uh, so anyway, so I had this. Thing with the guy, I'm saying, look, you, you cannot make these claims. It's completely unproven. It's dangerous, and you can put a lot of people's health at risk. You know, mm-hmm. so he deleted me. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I've so been deleted. The, the end. The I've been deleted by a few people because I'm pro GMO, uh-huh. and on the left, f- for the groups that I'm involved in, for some reason, a lot of them are against GMOs. Uh-huh. I don't know why. They seem to be scared about pesticides. It's because I, I didn't understand that organic they, they use, they use pesticides. fewer pesticides, I think, than I, 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 all right. <laughs> right. So we had a debate about the EU membership between Solidarity uh-huh. and EU. They both wanted to leave the EU, but it was For different one, one's a socialist, one's uh-huh. a capitalist. And uh, after the podcast was done, uh, he mentioned somewhere about uh, it was something during the podcast where he was talking about big pharma. Uh-huh. And I agreed with the fact that profit over health isn't good, but then he started talking about uh, how chemicals inside medication is bad for you and stuff I was like they come from natural sources most of the time yeah, yeah. you can't really say that and he started arguing with me I was right mm. but he was arguing anyway and then at the end of the podcast he we, we were speaking a wee bit and he told us about uh, a study in Aberdeen on GMOs that caused cancer and it was proven turns out it wasn't there checked yeah, it yeah. and he also told us that synthetic chemicals <sighs> are dangerous and they get stored in your fat they just roll about your stomach and then so. okay, just okay. make more f- chemicals and toxins inside your body mm. and now the icebreaker tell them where he works what oh he works uh, for an energy company oh really so aye so that, <laughs> that's fun yeah yeah okay. you know he done something with the NHS or something? oh aye he was on the fucking <laughs> fuck's sake he was on the board for the NHS in Fife Jesus is that no scary? Yeah. That is terrifying to me. That was the, that's the I've never had a proper run about this on the podcast yeah. before. <laughs> I've been trying to sort of keep... Because we were meant to be getting him back on and then when I found out that it was anti-vaccines and stuff and mm. then that it was again on the board of the NHS I was like, somebody that's on the board of the maybe, NHS maybe. was anti-vaccines. Uh, maybe it would be good to get him on to talk no, about No, I wouldn't it. because he'd fucking infuriate just me. Go a craft your nut. He, he would really... Because he's just so fucking... He's you. He's you, kid. Aye, aye. I mean... He's been. He's been. Consul- I love how there's another thing. He's, he's UKIP. Ah, it's a shorthand, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. An anti-vaxxer UKIP. <laughs> <laughs> what a lad! <laughs> Some of the other folk we've had in, we, like Bill, says he's alright with Peter because he's one of the less mental ones. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think David Alexander said the same thing. I was like, no, he's not. Mm-hmm. He's maybe not as bad on the immigration side of things as some of the other ones. Yeah. But he's still fucking insanely wrong uh-huh. about everything. 
So he's still quite UKP. <laughs> You kind of just, you kind of just forget that he's in UKIP. I mean, oh, yeah. he's in UKIP for a fucking reason. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that's my rant about science. <laughs> Did you go? No, that was fantastic. I enjoyed that. Aye. Give me, yeah. turn, give me, time to turn the light on as well. Fantastic. <laughs> so the answer to the science cafe. Yeah, you got anything coming up soon? Aye, aye. So what we'll do? I think our next one will be in September. And uh, what what we had done previously was. We we had set it up to be the last Thursday of the month to kind of keep this kind of so people always knew when it was, but it didn't always work out that way because somebody it wouldn't suit somebody at the last minute or or whatever else or it wouldn't suit the venue because they would have again a, a big coach load of folk yeah and uh, <coughs> and as well it just somehow it seems to be I, I tend to travel quite a lot at the end of the month which yeah. the way it seems to be so um, I thought we'll just do it on a more of an ad hoc basis now so it never suits the speaker. And suits the venue, then we'll just do it then, you know. Yeah. Rather than try and regiment it, because it's just it doesn't. Uh, but we've got. So I'm working with a. Um, we've got a visual artist working with us just now called uh, Nigel Kapanova, and uh, and this is very uh, cool because for I mean you're talking about videos earlier as well, and yeah. I, I'd really like to make a a, a cool video basically yeah. about um, about what I do. So a lot of science videos. Um, done in a very um, similar manner to each other. We've got a talking head and then you have some kind of thing and the music, the background music's terrible, right? Yeah. There's some ja- like acid jazz compilation, uh. you know, free license <laughs> stuff, right? And I once and I saw this great one and I, for the life of me now I can't remember the name of it. They're, they're a Swiss company and they're, they're, they work with a thing called electro um, electroactive polymers where you <clears throat> you can shape a polymer and you apply electricity to it and it, keep, it takes a certain form mm-hmm. and you take away the electricity of the battery or whatever and it, it falls back and you can make really interesting shapes with it and do interesting things and they, they use them for things like um, I think like the pacemakers and things like that now so it's more like a muscle you can make basically a fake muscle with this stuff right, right? Right. and uh, this company made a beautiful video and it was just very well done you know and had very good music on it and stuff and I was like this is what I want to do and uh, I, I, I used to do a lot of music for um, bands and things like that and I thought, well, I can do. I can, I'm, I'm confident I could do a nice bit of music for a nicely filmed thing, mm. but I'm not a filmmaker or anything. But the point is, that a lot of scientists, just because we're scientists, we don't necessarily have a good visual um, sense of things like what looks good, what what really grabs folk about your stuff. Um, so we, we have an artist working with us at the moment, and uh, we're doing we're doing a few different things, and a lot of it's to do with the the, the landmine detection and stuff like that. So w- will it be in the sense of like um, like showing? Like in the visualization sense, will it be like getting something like shown kind of like if you were talking about kind of evolution, you would get a kind of a visualization of the evolution of the scale sure, and stuff sure. like that. So if you're talking about other certain things, what kind of things are you talking about adding into this visual? Well, uh, she's been doing things like seen the comment. I'll get to that. In a okay, okay. Um, well, she's um, things like sculpture using light to to visualise things and, and, and different mm. things like that so um, it's, it's a work in progress at the moment and we're looking at various nice things nice ways to present it you know so, mm-hmm. uh, so I'm hoping then that that'll be a nice thing that we can use in the future to say this is what we're doing and you know and it can be appreciated both on a scientific level and an artistic level you know where mm. it's, it's suitable for galleries and things like that as well It's handy because we're used to, used to seeing uh, Brian Cox next to a rock Aye. saying hi I'm Brian Cox this is a rock Yeah, uh, this is where the rock is from like and then then he shows a graph uh-huh. and he continues on and then it's again terrible music yeah yeah so it'd be great to kind of work on something like that as well because uh, or, or it's just a black background with like CGI stars mm. that's yeah that, yeah that was <laughs> essentially what a cosmos was Right. It was just Neil deGrasse Tyson was a just great, in front of you. There was a great sketch of you. You, you had the only one excuse. Aye, aye. There was, um, there was a guy that does uh, history documentaries and stuff. Like, like, like kind of long-haired Scottish guy. Oh, Neil Oliver. I think that's the guy. Aye. He does all these documentaries and they, they've done a parody of it on the uh, only one excuse. Uh-huh. And the guy who'd done like, the traditional thing, he was in like a historic Scotland area. And it was like a wee arched area. Like a big small arch. And he was like, hey, hi, I'm... Neil Oliver. Mm. Uh, this is about historic Scotland, and then he like, runs past, like puts his head slowly past the sun and says, "Here's me kicking through." Oh, <laughs> fantastic sketch! I'll try. And, I'll send it to you. It's great. So, I mean, similar art, similar. <laughs> Love that stuff, man. Mm. It's just, it, aye, it's just. Some things a bit lazy. I feel. Well, it's, it's 
meant to be educational. Uh-huh. So I think entertainment sometimes comes in secondary to them. Mm-hmm. They're trying to... I think maybe it's they're worried that if you're too entertained you're not going to be taking stuff in mm. I think maybe the, it's the MTV style of editing and stuff like that seems to appeal to a lot of people like cutting everything five seconds oh yeah, uh, yeah. cuts and stuff like that so a lot of the science documentaries try, try and kind of shy away for that yeah I mean the stuff in BBC4 is pretty good you right. know, a lot of, they do like Horizon and stuff like that. Yeah, stuff like that, yeah, and, and the Sky at Night and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's pretty cool. Right, we'll go into this comment. It was okay. uh, basically, it uh, looks like you've actually got an educated guy in this podcast for once. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, well. Thank you very much. Well, well, is that a compliment to us? <laughs> definitely well, a compliment to you, definitely but to us. compliment to us. Killer for us. Oh, ah, it is. <laughs> That's it. And that's discrediting Carlo as well, unfortunately. And she was on the podcast at one time. Well, there you go, actually. So, so it's discrediting her. to Ronnie Moore. Also, idiot. Ah. Thank you. So, uh, I will, uh, you got anything else you want to add, man? Oh, I'd love to just speak all day about go. physics. But I've got none I was in my mind. Anything you want to bring up? Is there anything that you, you plan on... Uh, is there anything in your mind that you think could be worked on in the future that you'd maybe want to partake in? Like, once you're finished with the... Well, I mean, we're moving on to the IED um, field, you know, which is a lot different from landmines, you know, in the mm-hmm. sense that uh, obviously they're homemade, you know, compared to a landmine, which is generally going to be factory made, you know, by a, a large arms company. Mm-hmm. So you've got to look at things like the IEDs, like <clears throat> they're strapped to people's bodies and they're they're going through airports and things. And in fact, today, I haven't uh, seen the news since I saw the breaking news thing, but somebody has set off a suitcase bomb in Nuremberg, or just outside Nuremberg. Mm-hmm. Uh, about four o'clock this afternoon, and it seems it was filled with aerosol cans. Mm-hmm. Right, so I mean, what you might have in the future then is somebody has a small amount maybe of um, TATP, this homemade explosive, a small amount of that, a suitcase packed full of something you buy in the supermarket, you know. So that's going to have a lot, a lot of big challenges. And just in the past few weeks or a few months, it's been it's been nuts, hasn't it, in terms of these terrorist attacks? Well, there's and, been and things like that. that yeah, so this <laughs> is, uh, I mean, in fact. To go back to your pseudoscience uh, thing, the this is my favourite subject. Yeah, the, the, I, I like it as well, and I've been trying to find somebody to, to to get it on for the science cafe as well, actually. But one thing that directly affected me, in a sense, what? Okay, I mean, people would like you know talking about all these fad diets and stuff, which is amusing to me, you know, but it doesn't really affect me. Detoxes and detox and all this stuff, I. But there's a guy who um, who had made these fake bomb detectors. A guy based in England. I don't know if you heard about this, and he yeah. got jailed for it recently. And but he basically got these like plastic, imagine like a plastic toy gun or something like that, right? And he attached a a, a carry reel to it. And you know, like water dowsers, right? So that's a very very small change in your wrist muscle that you don't even know yourself. Oh, I've seen that. Did James yes. Randi do a bit on this? Aye, James Randi's talked about this before. But you don't even realise you're you, you think you're as steady as possible mm. but your, your muscles are still moving and it, it can have a big effect on something that's kind of hanging there on a, 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 a Kimbo kind of thing mm. and so this guy basically a car aerial mm. stuck it onto a plastic thing and uh, he sold millions of them you know and like the Pakistani military bought them and all these people and the thing was empty right and they, I was saying earlier on about you know things people don't like things being too light because they, they think they're cheap this is something that I'd learned when I was developing instruments for, for companies so you, you do try and have a bit of weight to it, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, So the, the same with this guy. I mean, so folk come back to me, well, this feels deadly. I mean, why are you selling it to us for all this? All oh, right, I. So he goes back and he sticks a circuit into it, but it doesn't do anything. It's like a circuit he's taking out a hairdryer or something, right? Jesus. And, um, and he sells them again. And then he, he, it had a huge effect on all these, you know, a lot of people were killed, basically, because mm-hmm. the, the military or the police or whoever thought they were using something that was a real bomb detector, and it wasn't. Mm-hmm. So the, this affects me in the sense that now when I do come to take what I've built into a market and trying to sell it not, not, not me selling it you know but to, to try and get people to use it yeah. I mean uh, there might be a bit of scepticism there because people say oh no this guy told us that uh, we'd be able to find Aye. a bomb with his thing and now you're coming up to us with a thing and you know so uh, so that, that was just really really kind of um, and I was thinking well you know, this, this is the problem with these pseudo scientists as well I mean they're they're, they're taking away the, the in a lot of ways, the trust of a real scientist or a real engineer or something mm. like this as well, not not just the kind of the health thing of diets or or cancer treatments or whatever, you know. So yeah. they're everywhere. So we must it's remain always, vigilant. It always <laughs> seems to be the minorities that they believe, though. Like in yeah. the instance of the anti-vax crowd, it will be they'll dismiss every physician that supports vaccines. Mm. But Andrew Wakefield is a fucking god. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems to be he he's 
been vilified by getting his doctor status taken away from him, and so he's obviously telling the truth. He's a martyr. Aye. Yeah, yeah. But he's fucking making a shit ton more money than he was <laughs> when he was an actual physician. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people are saying, nah, they did it for the money because he ruined his career. Uh, it, it must be some kind of anti... Uh, this was an anti-establishment thing where you've got... Like I say, a lot of people think it's kind of like this appeal to authority and all that. Like, like, trust me, I've studied this stuff, you know, and people don't like being spoken to like that, maybe, and it's a case of, well, I want to believe this guy because this, this suits my point of view, this suits my way of thinking about it. You know, I don't know. Have, but have, even as a conspiracy theorist, I used to be a quite pretty hardcore conspiracy theorist. Okay. And uh, I, never, I was never really into the anti-science stuff. I never bought Ken Trails. I was a mm. wee bit anti-vaxxer. Even mm-hmm. I still got my flu vaccines, kind of. I blamed it on me being scared of needles, but uh-huh. it was also because I'd been taught at some point that there was a cancer cell inside vaccines. <laughs> Later found it was not look shit, but I I never seemed to go as far as some people are going now. Like there's this a uh, this treatment in the US where. I can't remember what it's actually called, but essentially they're using bleach enemas oh, I've heard about this. on yeah, autistic yeah. kids yeah, yeah, in order yeah. to cure autism. Yeah. Then so they're, getting, they're getting the insides of kids fawn out uh-huh. and saying, oh, it's just parasites, it means you're doing well. Add mere. Uh-huh. Oh, fuck off! <laughs> oh, really it frustrates every inch of my body. Uh-huh. And there's a lot of body there. <laughs> I'm done now. <laughs> there you go. Well, I think that's a perfect uh, way I'll to end. Bust the fucking artery here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much, Ross, for coming in. Thanks for having me. Uh, you want to plug your date again? For um, the, for well, the we're on uh, we're on Facebook, and uh, if you just search for Answer All the Science Cafe, you'll find us. And uh, you can email us at Answer All the Science Cafe at gmail dot com, and we can add you to the the, the mailing list. Um, uh, and we'll send you information, and we're also on Twitter at Answer Sci. Uh, yeah, so I think I think that's me. I'll put all the links below as well, so Perfect, if anybody wants to find anything. Huh? So there. So again, thanks very much, man. All right, thanks Thank again. Appreciate it. Uh, cheers, lads.